USA versus England, the first in a pair of European friendlies for the United States women's national team. It was the world champions against the European champions at Wembley in front of a sold out crowd incredible scenes to, to watch this on television. I can't imagine everyone that was there and, and how they must be feeling. Uh, but England snapping the United States 13 game winning streak. Uh, the English side end up defeating the Americans two to one, all of the goals coming in the first half. Uh, but there were a number of players missing. And, and we had talked about this in our preview, but from England side, there was no Leah Williamson, no Alessia Russo uh, from the United States side, no Alex Morgan, no Taylor Corniak, no Mallory Pugh, at the last minute in this one. So um, uh, let's dive right into it. Starting lineup that was rolled out for the United States side, Alyssa Nair in goal along the back line. It was Alana Cook, Sophia Huerta, Naomi Gurma, and Emily Fox. In the midfield, it was Lindsay Horan, Rose Lavelle, and Andy Sullivan. And then up top, Trinity Rodman gets her very first start with the United States women's national team, Sophia Smith, and then Megan Rapino. Did anything stand out, surprise you all from this starting lineup? I know Sandra and I talked about what we wanted to see in this front line. Um, Blacko not going out for the win, going out to get experience for these players. Um, what's the first thing that stood out to you, Lori, when you read this lineup? Um, you know, I don't think a, a ton of surprises um, in the lineup given – um, some of the, the time that Megan Rapino had come off the bench, um, especially with Mal Pugh um, being gone. So her getting the start, I, I don't think was like um, a big surprise. And I mean, I think we've seen the majority could have said, you know, surprising that uh, Becky Sauerbrunn didn't get the start. But other than that, I mean, listen, Naomi Germa was dynamite um, in the back. And so, yeah, not too many surprises in the starting lineup um, from where I'm, from what we've seen previously, or at least leading up um, to this game, what were your front three that you were you were both looking for? Oh, I wanted Robin to start. Yeah, same. Oh, yeah, fair, fair. Yeah. fair. <laughs> I was just like enough. I, mean, I, I kind of, I yeah. uh, that that's a good shout. I mean, I I figured she would um, coming in just because if you don't have Alex Morgan, and then I mentioned Malcolm yeah. in a second, I was hoping that she was going to um, start anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted Rapino, I wanted Smith, and I wanted Rodman up top, and that's what I got. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But there was a lot of energy. Totally thrilled, uh, I'm with you. I was totally thrilled to see, um, you know, Gurma get tasked, you know, with the star as well. Um, I think it was a little surprising that it was like a, a Gurma and, and Cook combination because I just sort of, it just sort of feels like up until this point, it's either been one of the center backs alongside uh, Becky Sauber. And so to see the two of them mm -hmm. um, together in, in this very big spotlight um, definitely felt like a bit of, of a test, but, uh, and they got one pretty early on, but um, I liked the way that duo sort of played themselves back into the game. Yeah. It, it was good. I mean, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, it might, it might be time. Like we might have seen the shift happen. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I think, Becky is obviously a fantastic captain, a fantastic leader, but she's getting older. She's lost a little bit in terms of her speed. And so I don't think, um, I don't think like this transition is unwarranted. Um, I, my gut is that Vaca wishes he had a little more time. Um, but like, you don't have the luxury of time um, when you're a national team coach. You don't have like club play where you can work on tactics yeah. and all of this, like you got to jump in. And so I think it's great that Gurma got the start um against uh England in a big profile a high profile scenario like this I think it's the exact test that was needed I think she answered the call quite frankly I thought she was really good in her positioning um and to me this is probably my center back pairing for the world cup um it really is um and I don't mean to discredit Becky Sauerbrunn I just really feel like you know the shift has to happen eventually um and I think now might be the time. I think we'll know a little bit more too once we have the World Cup draw and you kind of see some of yeah. the competition and who's in group. Um, that might play a little bit more of a role too. But I also think that's perhaps why um, Megan Rapino gets a little bit of the nod. You're like, okay, look, we want a little bit of that leadership. Um, we're not getting it in Becky Sauer run. We have it in Nair and like in, in goal. Um, so I think all of those factors layer in um, when you're trying to decide a starting 11 and it's not nece necessarily as simple as oh let's just switch these two and it's it's a simple change in that way i think there's no. a lot of factors 
Yeah, it's never as simple as you want. I wanted Germa to start in the back. I actually thought she would maybe start alongside Sauerbrunn, but um, I, I think that Cook did well in there. I like that combination, but you guys just touched on it. This is at Wembley, a sold-out crowd. Uh, Trinity Rodman gets her first start. The back line between Fox, Germa, Cook, Huerta, that group of four, um, Fox leads them at 22 caps. So this was an incredibly young group. I think the average cap of the starting 11 was like 55 as a group, which is really, really low. And Megan Rapinoe is bringing that average up a lot. But does how much does that challenge them against a tough, loud crowd at Wembley? How much does it benefit those young players? Because, hey, we're heading into a World Cup year in just a few months. How much does that benefit these young players? Oh, that's awesome. But that's also what you dream about. That's the excitement of these are the games you want to play in. And I think that that is exceptional, right? This is what we want to see. And this is also um, why the NWSL is so important, because it's putting Naomi Gurma in a position to lead her San Diego Wave team. And then she can step right in to our full women's national team in front of 80,000 people and perform like she did. And so those are why those minutes, those are why um, those games are so important. But yeah, I mean, this is this is exciting times. And I think next summer's World Cup is going to be one of the biggest events um, we've ever seen in sport. Um, that seems, I think, a big thing to say, but I really think it's going to be one of the biggest events we've seen. And so they're going to be playing in front of these crowds. So give these players the opportunity. I mean, they deserve it. They, um, and you want to test, you want to test, right. And see, and I think the same goes with Trini Rodman. There was a, um, a lot of talk because she hadn't had a ton of minutes under Blacko in front of big crowds. Right. That's a goal. In my opinion, she put herself in a great position. Um, and she, you know, sees the day. And I mean, when you look at some of these players that had to step in and you want them to perform well, they did. And so I think overall, listen, it was a loss, but overall, I'm, I thought it was a, a lot of good takeaways for the U.S. team coming out of this game. And keep in mind, too, like all of these players, especially these young players, they could maybe have five or ten more caps if it wasn't for COVID, right? So there is – and even to – even if you get those caps, like you're playing in empty stadiums. You're playing in a totally different environment. And so there's a little bit of catch-up. Not, not that anybody did anything wrong. It just is the hand that the world was dealt with COVID. So I think getting younger players these minutes and these caps is critical um, because there is a developmental loss. We'll never know exactly what it is or how to calculate it, but COVID really did have an impact in terms of the decisions that Blacko can make in terms of rolling over and bringing new players in or having to stick with older players and not even having the ability to bring anyone in because no games were happening, right? So I think there's um, even more weight and importance that are going to be uh, factored into these games leading up to the World Cup just because, you know, over the course of the last two years, that time has been lost. And also, uh, that's a great point, Danielle, and also the fact that we travel because yeah. Yes, we, we we don't travel that much. And then to travel, and now we're going to get another game against Spain, I'm sure we'll look very different, uh, maybe in terms of the environment. But um, important is, um, with this group to see what it's like to travel away, um, perform with not a lot of preparation time, having to adjust to with jet lag and just the, the time change. So um, really important aspects, I think, heading into next summer. No, yeah. I'm with you, Danielle. I think it's a really important you know, point that you bring up about, about COVID. I just sort of feel like now in 2022, we're starting to see some of these players kind of get back into that more kind of regular, consistent form. I think you, when we even were looking at the younger players, if we're looking at a player like Smith, who, you know, went pro at a young age, but then obviously 2020 hit the, the reset button on literally everything around the globe and just not really sort of having that regular season under her belt during her rookie year. And then watching her in 2021 and we're seeing in 2022 what you know regular consistent play could look like for a, a player of her talented caliber so many great takeaways from uh this england side but i want to talk about some of the goals that were scored maybe not scored laura you already said it the trinity rodman <laughs> goal for you it's a goal it's a goal i'd love to hear that um kind of how the game unfolded for this u.s side uh ultimately losing two to one against england all the goals in the first half and var impacting two of the goals in this match england gets on the board first in the opening 10 minutes the u.s then equalizes in the 28th minute on a sophia smith goal that's that's Smith's 10th goal of the year, um, 11th career goal in just 24 appearances. I think that that she has 10 of her 11 goals this year. Um, 
does feed back to what you were just talking about, Danielle, about how this team couldn't get caps in 2020 with the COVID year and everything that happened. Uh, so then it's equalized in the 28th minute. England then takes the min- takes the lead again just five minutes later, a penalty kick that was reviewed on VAR. Uh, defender Haley Mace kicks bronze in the face and then Sanway scores the PK and then Rodney gets a goal <laughs> called offside VAR review. Laura, you're laughing. What do you what do you think about the, the PK? The I just Rodney the way you goal? Phrase it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm laughing yeah. at. Kicks are in the face. Kicks are in the face. <laughs> in the face. I mean, it, it also happened like five minutes later, it felt like when they were uh, reviewing the play, but because it was inside the box, it ends up being a penalty kick. But um, the Rodman right. goal, uh, that was tremendous i i thought it was a goal as well Lori. yeah i mean listen i think you know it this game to me um you know you can you can look at some of the stuff where the u.s can improve for sure and mm-hmm. then you can also look at the where, areas where the u.s can dominate and i think they exposed england in some ways in transition that even england would say that they haven't been exposed and not even in the euros so and one of those was in that goal i mean the the ability to be able to have free flowing um, front line in that play. I mean, it was, I enjoyed watching uh, Sophia Smith play in that central role. We see her more occupy that space um, with Portland. Um, obviously, a, a different formation that they play, but for her to be able to roll wide and, and kind of get on the end of that ball, and then that allows for more fluidity for a Trinity Rodman and then Megan Rapino. So I thought it was. Um, a fabulous goal. And I think it's really tight call to make um, personally. Um, but I'm also just like, you know, enjoying as a fan and like <laughs> wanting to, to call it a U.S. goal. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, listen, there's, there's a lot of takeaways in the fact that like, you can look at this if, if Alex Morgan's is healthy, does she get the start? Right. But so right. no, Sophia Smith is in there. It gives them a different look. All of these little elements add to versatility going into the World Cup, which is the ultimate picture and what all of these tests are to evaluate the team and evaluate players and to see who fits the best. And, uh, you know, to Danielle's point too, I think that is something really important to keep in mind is that it's not always just like, okay, who's the best 11, right? It's about who's fitting the right. best um, in different positions, who's your opposition, um, and how are we lining up um, against who we're playing and and who can help us get the result? And, you know, I think in a lot of ways it was a lot of fun to watch and there's some some stuff that um, should be incredibly proud about. When you look at this uh, side for the U.S. defensively, um, yes, having a, a younger back line, but Danielle, you said that Cook and Gurma, they're your center backs moving forward, barring any changes that happen. But um, how do you ra- how do you uh, rate their defensive play against this England side and, and what they were faced with in, in forms of the England attack? I think um, they did a fine job. I mean, I think it – Let's be honest, the left back position had a rough day. I mean, between Emily yeah. Fox and going out with concussion and then the Mace um, penalty kick, like it was rough, right? I mean, there were some mistakes, but like overall, I, I guess I feel a little bit like like Lori that yes, you know, the United States is expected to win everything all of the time. Um, and, you know, there's that pressure and we talk about, what was it like a 21 game streak that was broken and blah, blah, blah. But um, I think it was a really great um, developmental opportunity. I think a lot of questions were answered for Vlatko, which I think is important. And when I look at the back line, um, sure, there were mistakes made, like, sure, it wasn't clean. Um, but like we're used to seeing, we're not used to seeing the the United States play against a team this high of caliber consistently. I mean, this is the reality when you get against top 10 teams in the world Mm -hmm. consistently is like you are under pressure. And when you look at a young back line um, that is, is forced to be playing against a top team in an environment like that, like I'm okay with the progress. I'm okay with, you know, giving them some time to grow and, and to learn. So was it great? Was it terrible? No, I would probably give the back line a B minus. In there, like putting a grade on it. Respect. But, but, <laughs> like, that's a, I'm okay. With, like I'm actually yeah. like pleased with the fact that yeah. it's a tough challenge and that there's things to grow from. You learn more and you from the mistakes and and the growth in that. And I think it's a critical time for that growth. Yeah, I think oh, leading up to the game, there was more, there was like heavier emphasis on that. I think also considering the week that the players had leading up 
to this yeah. game, right? With everything happening off of the pitch, um, that there was far less emphasis on like a like so much of like a result, whether it's a winning result or if it was a draw. And there was a far more emphasis on uh, the overall event and experience of that actual game as a whole. And, um, you know, we're not talking about some kind of blowout here by any means. We're talking wow. about a 2-1 loss that was, you know, largely one of the bigger experiences of the careers for some of these players. You know, I think that uh, the coaching staff was perhaps hopeful that they would have gotten some similar experiences during CONCACAF qualifiers with the games in, in Mexico. And there was, you know, perhaps maybe that final group test right against Mexico where they uh, were the visiting side and the opposition and the, the crowd was somewhat against them. That was maybe the one time over this calendar year that maybe they sort of had that experience. And I think it, you know, we heard, and Anofsky in some of the post game, you know, saying that it actually checked off a lot of boxes that they wanted, um, you know, to sort of have checked off as they were leaving England. And a big one of those was getting more experience for some of these players playing in front of the, that type of crowd and that type of facility and, you know, being the, the visiting opposition and uh, you know, should they find themselves in difficult game scenarios, how those particular players were going to manage that. And um I think a two-one loss, a near a near two-two draw, I don't think is a, is a bad day at the office for that squad. Yeah, it also say I'll add to that. I think sometimes defensively we just think of the back four, and I think in a lot of ways yeah. the back four did, you know, a good job. And I also think it also highlighted if we don't get the press right all the time, when we do, we can score from it. Obviously, picking off the ball and then that led to Sophia Smith's goal. But if we don't, then teams like England will be able to play through that and then leave us exposed defensively. So I think it highlights as a collective, the team and how we're defending, picking our choosing our times, when to press as a group, if it's not on perfect time to play against an England team to drop back in more of a middle block, absorb the pressure. And then the team's successful on, let's be honest, on, on the counterattack. So play for right. that sometimes, you know? So, yeah. so more so I think it highlights what does the whole entire team look like defensively and how are we, um, you know, how are we dealing with the pressure and the ability for a team like England to be able to play through and play out of the, the press. And to be fair, Lori, I mean, I don't think the midfield was great defensively. No, yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. So, yeah. That's what we need to talk about before we talk about Spain. Clear. To be very clear, I think that is an area. I mean, we've talked about it on this show too, just an area to get sorted out, right? Like what's your what's the best mix? Who's pressing? Because it did look like we were in a bit of a four four two kind of defensively formation at times, yeah. with Rose popping out next to Sophia yeah. Smith. But if you don't pinch in, then what does that look like? Because they you have players like Kira Walsh who um Danielle and I saw throughout the Euros just dictate the tempo like you've never seen a number six in a long time do. And yeah. then you had the in standway in there. Um, those players can play and they had control in a lot of ways of the game. Yeah. I was thinking of you, Danielle. I was thinking of you watching this game. I was just like, I think Danielle might have some things to say about that middle third. Well, yeah, but then but then you look at the, the goal that it scored and it scored from Lindsay Heron pressure, right? Like exactly. so it, I mean, you know, that's what I'm saying. So if you get it right, we see that we can get from the goal. And if it's not on though, then you can drop back. Yeah, exactly. So, so what's the biggest thing that you learned about the United States midfield and maybe what they lacked or what they did well throughout this match? I mean, I, 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 I think I take away a little bit um, like they're, I, I need them to focus consistently on their positional play. Um, to me, I think that's still like the fluidity on attack is great, but it's just like, you're thinking about the attack and these players are attacking oriented when you think of, you know, Lindsay Horan and you think of Rose Lavelle specifically, but you throw in Ashley Sanchez or whomever might be in there, right? Like their strength lies in their attack. And so mm -hmm. how, how you're thinking about your shape defensively, like if you have like a quarter of your brain turned on to the, the, like as a defender, I'm always thinking of if this goes wrong, how do we solve it? If this goes wrong, how do we solve it? Right. And so as an attacker, how are you like having most of your energy thinking about how to develop the attack, but having a small piece of your brain focused on the worst case scenario. And it, cause it can't just be Andy Sullivan. I think we had the luxury of Julie Ertz, like being this destroyer in midfield for so long. Um, and she would just clean up any mess and nobody really had to think about it because she was great at it. 
One, I think the game is evolving. That doesn't allow for one person to be solely responsible for that. And two, I think, you know, Andy Sullivan has a different kind of game. And so the collectively, the U.S. needs to think differently um, about how it manages that space in midfield. Um, and so for me, I think it's, it's time um, and it, it, it takes some more effort, but I still think there's evolution there. Yeah. I'm laughing because um, I was going to say resting defense, but you know, <laughs> I have a joke about um, soccer terms that are thrown around. So exactly. So resting defense, people say like, you know, what positions are you in when you're an attack that you can disrupt defensively? Right. So I'm like cracking up in my head over here unnecessarily, but um yeah, I mean, I agree. And I also think there's, you know, some of the things that we've talked about on here is what is formationally does that look like? Do you right. play with two holding mids um, or two two pivots? Um, double pivot. Yeah, double pivots, exactly. Um, or, or, you know, or not. And then what does that look like just in terms of who's filling in the gaps? Um, is that an outside back that steps in as a number six next to, to deny any sort of transitional moments? But again, we've talked about that. But those are the things I think that, and they're small details, right? But everybody has to be on the same page because otherwise you do get caught, especially as the, as the teams continue to get better. Um, the game evolves, as Danielle said. So, yeah. And the reality is, quite frankly, at the international level, you don't have the luxury of one solution typically right. being the only solution, right? Like sometimes it will have to be an outside back who shifts in. Sometimes it'll have to be a center back who steps up. Sometimes it'll have to be um, Lindsay Haran or Rose Lavelle who drops in or something like you have to be able to solve all of these problems. And I think the game has evolved in that way. And that is like the best skill that I can tell young players is like, figure out how to solve the problem. It can't just be a coach yelling at you from the sideline saying, run here, do this, do that. Like you have to be able to read and assess and solve the problem. And quite frankly, that's why Naomi Gurma is so good at what she does. Yep. She can read and assess and then solve the problem before it even really looks like a problem. Um, and that's that's the next step for for this player or these players collectively to have to be able to do that. 